So the Sunday school teacher had been teaching as hard as he could. The, the last several weeks he was teaching his five and six year old children just that whole idea about knowing Jesus as your Savior and, and what He's done for us. And so now he came back before the class and he thought, I'll review and just see how well they're doing. So he said, now class, we've been learning about Jesus, right? And they're all, yes. And he said, so, I talked about going to heaven, right? And what it takes? Yeah, that's right. And so he said to him, now, if if I come to church every Sunday in my really, really nice clothes and I sit and I smile real pretty, will that get me into heaven? And the kids are, no. Okay, that's good. Well, how about if I come to church every Sunday and I teach this class and I tell you all the things that you should do and you shouldn't do, will that get me into heaven? And the kids are, no. And he's like, okay, that's really good. So he said, how about if I come to class and I teach you every Sunday about Jesus and when you do really well and you learn and I give you candy, will that get you into heaven? No. He said, very good class. He said, so can somebody tell me how to get what you have to do to get to heaven? And one little boy just threw his hand up right away and he says, okay, little Billy, how do you get to heaven? You gotta die. <laughs> well, unfortunately, well, fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which, that really is kind of true, isn't it? The Bible tells us clearly that Jesus died and that his death is what secures for us assurance, an eternal place with God. Now, we have to receive Him as our Savior. We have to ask Him to, to take what He did on the cross and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. And that really is what gets us to heaven. And so that big question, you know, that diagnostic question of if you were to stand before Jesus today and He asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? Uh, the answer would be, because of what you did, Jesus. Because you died on the cross. I couldn't have done anything. I was lost. But you died and you forgave my sins. That's why I can ask, would you let me in, Jesus? And he would say, enter into your place of rest and your reward. Well done, good servant. Well, we're kind of talking about that and hopefully taking that point and that message to other people. Uh, last week we started talking about it and, and um, I wonder if maybe for some of you, did you look at people a little bit differently this week and say, oh, you know, this might be an opportunity. Now, it didn't happen this week. It actually happened just before that. I'm not, I'm not at all going to say that I'm great at this stuff. But I do kind of try to look at opportunities and see, is this an opportunity for me to talk to somebody? And I get into situations lots and lots of times where I get to talk. About a week ago, a little more than a week ago, uh, Ann and I were at, uh, I think it was Walmart in Worcester that we were at, and we were coming through the line, and there was a woman there in line, or uh, at the clerk, and uh, she seemed to be really nice and all that, and we didn't have that many items, and it wasn't crowded. There was nobody else around. In fact, it was one of those few times you go up, put your stuff down, and get going. <clears throat> and I noticed that she had, you, you know, Walmart, I know, my dad did this too, they have buttons and badges all over them. It's almost like the more buttons and badges you have, the probably the better the employee you are, I think. I, I'm sure I've seen my dad topple over a few times, a little front heavy there. But um, this lady, I went up, and she had a couple buttons and badges and the typical smiley face, but she had a, a um, thing that she had put a picture of someone, a young man, military. I'm not very smart, but... I said to her, I said, is Walmart requiring you guys to wear pictures of military people now? She said, no, that's my son. And she started telling me. Well, then I started talking to her about her son. And, and it led into something. I mean, we didn't, it was what? A minute. You know, that's about it. I didn't present the four spiritual laws. I didn't ask any diagnostic questions or anything like that, but just made a contact and let her know how much, you know, how thankful we for, were for her. I'll be praying for your son. She was telling me she was going that 
next week, that Monday, to go visit. I'll pray for you as you go visit your son. And and you have to do that to them, by the way, when you say that. And I don't know what that will become. I have no idea. But I think we talked before about the idea that it takes several contacts with people before they're open to come to the gospel. Now, I know you're not probably doing all the material that Bill Hybels has that I've done, and I don't remember where he puts in this material. It might be in his hardback book. By the way, if you don't have the book and the notebook, you're welcome to come and get one. Um, we've got a couple left. And, um, and everybody's welcome to come to the, even if you only make one of the sessions, even if it's only once a week. You said, I missed last week, won't make the others. Come to a session this week. That's fine. Because they're all good and they're all um, separate ideas and you can use any of it. Well, somewhere in his material, he talks about people that are not believers are in a negative scale, like their relationship with God. Maybe some are at a negative 2, some are at a negative 15. And they need some stuff to get them from the negative up to that zero breaking point, turning point. That was a reference to David Jeremiah, by the way. It's his church drama team that did that this morning. And um, you need strokes to get you there so that your your heart's open and ready to hear hear the message of Christ and then receive them. And then you grow on the positive side. Well, maybe all you're going to do is take somebody from a negative 15 to a 13. But hey, that's closer. That's good. And then maybe the next guy comes along can take them up to 9 and then eventually someone. Last week we talked from First Corinthians 3 about some people are going to plant the seed. Other people are going to water it. And somebody's going to have the privilege of harvesting that. But you may be any one of those in the process but all of you are equally as significant and as important uh, as that. So hopefully we're looking at people differently. The reason why we're doing this whole thing is because we want to be sure that we bring people to faith and knowledge in Jesus Christ. If we were to have 100 people here today, which we might, and if we had 100 people in this room today, uh, and I started to interview you, I am sure if I ask you the question, do you have someone you care about that is living apart from God? Probably most of you would say, yeah, I do. I I have somebody I care about. It's a loved one. It might be a good neighbor friend. It might be somebody at work or somebody that you have an acquaintance with. You have somebody you know that isn't walking with God. I'm pretty sure most of us would say that. And if I were able to take the privilege of asking you another question, I might say to you, well, is it your goal and your hope that that person you care about could go to heaven? And I'm willing to guess that if 100% of you said yes to the first question, probably 100% of you are going to say, yeah, I really, really want them to be there when I'm there. I want them to be there too. Here comes the tough question. And then I would say to you, well... Are you doing anything, actively doing anything to make that happen? A lot of us are probably going to say, well, it depends on how you define actively, but really no. No, probably not. Well, with that in mind, we want to start to think through uh, some things about reaching people for Christ. Last week, we told you that there were some things that you needed to do. We said you needed to be willing to enter into the zone of the unknown. There's some times where we just got to go in there and and make ourselves vulnerable and build relationships. Then we have to listen to the promptings of the Spirit of God. Let Him lead us. You know, just you go in and have your normal conversation. I go up to a lady buying stuff and I just ask her about a picture on her badge. That's all I need to do. Uh, There's other things that I do and you could do as well. But then from there, let the Spirit of God lead. If she says, oh, would you pray for me because? Then say yes. And then find out what she wants. And then just do it. Just walk and do what, what God wants you to do in, in thinking through that. When you walk into a situation and you're starting to share with somebody and you're listening to the Spirit, I think there's some obvious questions that we ought to be asking as we're walking into that. And, uh, and now I'm going to approach somebody um, What are the things that I want to think about? What are the things that I need to pray about? What are the things that, you know, this person wants to talk about? These are things that we ought to be 
as focused on as we go in to make that conversation. So today, we want to look at just uh, probably three little things that maybe will help us. It's called the three living in 3D. And the first one is this, uh, developing friendships. We should be constantly looking for ways to make contacts with people. The idea of going up to a clerk. Uh, all of us um, <clears throat> go to restaurants. All of us, all of a sudden, have somebody who is serving us very personally. They're, they're taking our ideas of what we want and they're taking them back. They're getting prepared exactly what you and I want and they're all coming back with what we had ordered and they're presenting that to us and serving us. And we need to be sensitive to things like that. I think Christians, I, I hear from um, waiters and waitresses that sometimes Sunday afternoon is the worst time to be working because the Christians are sometimes the most demanding on the waiters and waitresses and often the uh, lower of the tips. And and that's not a good thing. We should be the opposite way around. We should be probably the best tipsters and we should also be the ones who are the most appreciative of those who are serving us. Now, I'm sure Carrie Jensen is up there amening everything I just said. She's like, big tips, big, big tips. Think that way, people. You're Christian. No, think bigger. Um, yeah, that's true. And um, and that's what we should do. And we have opportunities. You, you have a person who is intimately working with you. Uh, Bill Hybels tells that when he goes to restaurants, he often tries to, before he leaves, look up the waiter or waitress and say to them specifically a word of thanks and use the word that you you served me well today. He tries to say that. Let them know that he understands that they were a servant and they did a good job. And that's a good thing to do. I, I know I try to do things like that. There's other stuff I try to do with people like that. But it's not just, okay, so don't just get locked into saying, okay, now i got to be really good at this at restaurants. But there's other situations that you and I are into. Uh, in my case, and in some of it's positionally, I know that, but I go into a, used to go into the IGA. I almost, I almost dreaded going to the IGA because I'd run into people I knew and then conversations would have to come. And I love being with the people. It just was more what, whether my schedule was good today to do that or not. Because I know when I went down here, it would take an hour to buy a loaf of bread. I just knew it every time. And so I preferred to go somewhere anonymously if I could. One of the problems that you and I are running into in our Christian experience is the longer we walk with Christ, the fewer numbers of unsaved contacts that we have in our normal relationship. And I started to write myself some notes about this, and I said, it's only natural. And then I thought, well, now wait a minute, is it really natural? Uh, there's two sides of that story. One is it's normal because now I'm involved in the church, and now I'm involved in small groups, and now I'm involved in ministry things that take place, and, and my biggest fear of contact, for me, you're who I work with. You go to a, a grubby shop and work with a bunch of foul-mouthed kind of people. You're who I work with. See? That, so now you know who I complain about around the water cooler, right? Um, no, that's not true, but um, I, it's real easy for me to be lost in a real nice environment. They talk about ivory towers, and that's easy to do. But you can tend to be that way too, because as you're closer to Christ and you say, you know, that guy who I used to hang out with that talked that way and thought that way and did that way, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't desire what he desires. And so you throw yourself into the nice groups and, and you hang around with the nice people and the good Christian stuff, and eventually you find out that you know, you're not really sharing your faith. You're not being challenged in that way very much. Well, that's, that's natural because we should be desiring spiritual things and, and right relationships, but it's also unnatural because Christ has put us here to be salt and light, and we're supposed to call people. Jesus gave, um, in Luke chapter 15, he told three parable stories. I know you know them. Uh, one is about a lost coin. Another one's about a lost sheep. And another one's about a lost son. And we looked at one or two of those recently. And I mentioned to you that Warren Wearsby gave a summary. 
And he said all three of them have a similar concept. All of them talk about something that was lost, then something that was found, that same thing was found, and then there was rejoicing. There was rejoicing. Now, we used it a month ago when we were talking about uh, what the angels celebrate. Remember that? We talked about that the week before Christmas, what the angels celebrate. And they celebrate when people find find Jesus Christ the Savior. Jesus, in Luke chapter 15, was actually in an audience with a group of people that included Pharisees and scribes who were after Jesus. They were trying to mess him up. They were trying to find him guilty of something so that they could bring him down and get him discredited among the people. And Jesus tells these stories about, hey, a lady lost a coin and she searched everywhere until she finally found it. When she found it, she threw a big party because it was a a valuable coin. It was something very precious to her. A a shepherd had had 99 sheep that were fine, but one of them was lost. And when he realized that that was true, then he secured the 99 and went searching for the one. And when he found it, it was so great. And and he celebrated And a a man who had a son that became a prodigal and left him and, and just devoured his own life. It was terrible, the things he did. But when he came to his senses and all of his brokenness and came back, the dad threw a huge party and, and, and celebrated it. And it was sort of indicating to the Pharisees, you know, the things that you think are good and valuable, God doesn't always look at that. Most of us would have looked at the 99 sheep and said, well, let the one fall off the cliff. I still got 99 more. They'll reproduce. We'll be okay. But God's perspective is different. And God looks at the individual and cares deeply about every single individual. And it's not sheep number 100. It's also sheep number 92 and 86 and 74, and on down through every one of them. God looks at it as very, very precious and very significant in his viewpoint. We are all so very valuable. So we need to develop friendships, develop relationships, and be open to accept the people who are in uh, in that that we're entering into. When you start to um, to talk to people that you don't know or, or that you don't know real well or or you start to dig into people's lives, you're going to get a lot of junk. There is an awful lot of junk. And I guarantee you that the amount of junk that I see and hear in people's lives today compared to what it was when I came out of seminary, it's exponential. I mean, it is multiplied, this stuff. It's to the point now that I expect to hear a lot of garbage when I start dealing with certain people in certain circumstances it's just there. Their lives are bad and things are, are tough. And um, we need to learn to accept people. Because whether that person is doing what I think is good or bad, whether or not it's acceptable to me, the issue at the moment is God's grace going to their lives. And that's what's really most important. For me to uh, to overlook whatever it is they're doing and to say, yeah, but the real issue is where are you at with Jesus Christ? And then try to do whatever God has for me to do to help bring that person uh, closer. Every single interaction that you have with a person, no matter who they are, no matter what it is, even if it's on a telephone with a um, telemarketer or something like that, every opportunity is there for possibly bringing someone closer to Christ. So we need to um, develop friendships. Another thing we need to do is then, through those friendships, is to discover the person's story. We need to learn about them. Probably the the big word here would be the word listen. (laughs) We need to listen and learn what's going on in that person's life. This is where uh, sometimes it does take time. It takes time for them to uh, to open up and to tell us what's going on. Uh, our goal here is to uh, just be engaged with people and learn what's going on for them. That's It's really easy to do. Now, guys don't think so. Because guys tend to want to hear something and solve the problem and then get on to the next project. <laughs> um, but sometimes you just need to ask the right questions. Just how are you? What's happening? that kind of thing, and allow them to 
uh, share and tell us what's going on. Re- remember, <clears throat> every person that you come in contact with, every person that you develop a friendship with, every person that you start to discover their story about could be, could be just one prayer away from being saved for eternity. That is so significant. We don't know. Uh, it's really fun to, uh, to look at somebody and say, well, that guy's close and that guy can't possibly be close. Look how grungy he looks. <laughs> and, but we don't know that. We don't have that idea in our hearts and minds. God alone knows. And everybody we come in contact with is potentially very, very close to the kingdom of God. In Psalm 139, verse 14, it says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we often think about that in terms of the physical makeup that we have. God uh, has developed us and made us. And I know earlier today, when you were going through the announcements on the screen, you saw Lainey Michelle up there. Four pounds and five ounces, just a tiny, tiny little baby. Um, but God made her and all her little features and everything. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it just amazing uh, when babies are born and just how God oversees that whole thing? And 99.9% of the times it goes okay. It goes well. And we are physically made that way. But you know, the rest of that verse in Psalm 139.14 says this, Your works are wonderful. I know that very full well. I know that full well. Not just, I would say that, ex- that includes not just the works that God made me and I, and physically I'm complete and so that's good and so way to go God now. I wonder what else will happen in life. But it's beyond that. It's also not only does God make you, uh, physically, but He makes you complete as a person and He develops you and He brings you along with certain things in mind. Was it by accident? Was it by accident that you live where you live? Is that an accident? Is it an accident that you live in the the town and on the street that you live in, in the day and age that you live? Why are you alive today and not 150 years ago? Why weren't you somebody who fought in the Civil War? Why weren't you somebody who was born in the uh, Middle Ages in Europe somewhere? Why did God, was this all an accident? Was it all by chance? Was it just, you know, uh, the luck of the draw? I don't think so. I don't think you should think so either. Um, was it by accident that you do occupationally what you do? That the work you do? Uh, is that an accident that you were placed in that, that job and in that place and the people around you? Was that all an accident that God somehow was like, oh, I, I didn't know so-and-so was going to work beside you? and that he wanted to bring people into your sphere of influence, and he equipped you and made you because, God, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well, according to the psalmist. What God does is wonderful, and him bringing people together and into each other's influence, maybe he did that with a grander vision and a greater purpose in mind. Why do you think people are bored? (laughs) I've heard that all my life. I probably have said it a few times, I'm sure, when I was younger. But why are people bored? Why is it that I'm bored with my job? Why am I bored in, in my relationships? Why am I bored? Is it because we're not doing the exciting thing? Well, what's the exciting thing? The exciting thing is, and you can put this up for debate, and I'm sure if I were at the local pub, uh, they would argue me on this. But the exciting thing is doing the things that God's doing doing the thing that God cares about and, and seeing that. Remember the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, Paul, that's nice. Glad that you care about uh, people's spiritual life. What's the point? Because, Paul says, it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, not just for the Jew, but also then also for the Gentile. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. 
Paul, what are you telling me? Paul says, I'm involved in the most exciting endeavor that has ever touched the planet Earth. Now, I realize that computers are pretty big and they're fun. I don't know what an iPod is, but they sound exciting. Um, high definition TVs, those things, boy, those are great. And, um, oh, the NFL is pretty exciting. And, I mean, there's lots of high flying, fast moving, great things. But Paul said, that's nothing. That's nothing. Because what I do, I'm not ashamed to say this, I, I do this. I'm involved in the thing that God is doing, and that is the gospel, because it is God's power unto salvation. Well, what is God doing today? What is something that God's doing that's so impressed, impressive? Paul says God is bringing people to salvation in Him. And he's using his power and he's channeling it to see people's lives changed. That's where it's at. That's what's exciting. That's what people ought to be jumping on board for. And that's why sometimes we're bored because we don't look, we don't care, we don't see, we don't do, and we don't have anything to do with what God's doing, and we're missing the whole point. <clears throat> so when I walk into a relationship, I'm trying to develop a friendship, I'm trying to... Um, discern the story of the person, learn a little bit about them, then I need to be praying what's next and discern the next steps that God has and listening to the Spirit of God and letting Him talk to me and tell me. I need to follow the Holy Spirit's leading as I enter into conversation. And again, that may just simply mean talk about the picture on the lady's badge and then say something like, I'll pray for you, you know, and and maybe it doesn't go any farther, which it didn't. But maybe it would. Maybe she said, oh man, if you're going to pray, could you do this? Or why would you pray for me? Or whatever she would say. And just be open. We're going to see a clip here. Um, this is our advertisement for the small groups. And you're going to see this. And what you're going to find in this particular clip is uh, you're going to see a case where um, Bill Hybels tells about how uh, a relationship with an individual went from you know, being a stranger to a friendship to, to a matter of faith for that one individual. So we'll go to the video. I saw something so uh, valuable inside Dave. And uh, I remember just saying to myself, this is going to be a long, slow walk. He's got to see a Christian kind of walk the walk. I, ne I never put a time span on it. I just said, this is a guy I'd like to be friends with and let God do whatever God's going to do. I really wanted to make sure that it was God doing the work and uh, me riding in the second position. Before uh, regatta, I was preparing my little area on the sailboat, and Bill would come up and just ask me how my week had gone, how Beth was, maybe what had gone on at work. I mean, the conversations never really moved uh, towards faith or Christianity. And it, again, it was just so refreshing uh, to me that he was concerned about me as an individual and what was going on in my life. I think really trying to point someone in the direction of faith is usually the summation of a lot of little inputs along the way. I don't think it's the big three-hour talk where you start with creation and end at the end of the Bible. I, I don't think it's a great big theological brain dump all at once. I remember uh, Bill giving me a copy of Case for Christ before it was uh, ever even in print. And so in my travels around the country, uh, you know, on airplanes, I would pull that out and uh, read a few pages. And I really needed that because I was so inquisitive about the science part of it. So if you come back to one of the small groups tonight, Wednesday, Saturday, you're going to get to meet Dave Wright, who Bill... Uh, made a friendship with, had a relationship with, developed it, and then followed God's lead. And then, um, not to ruin the perfect ending, but Dave becomes a Christian, obviously. Not all of these, not every week you're going to meet someone who becomes a Christian. But uh, you can in that. But did you catch the one thing that Dave said? He, he used the word what was refreshing to him. Now here's a pastor that's trying to reach someone for Christ. And Dave said it was refreshing that he didn't preach at me, he didn't do all that kind of stuff, he cared about me as an individual. He wanted to know how my week was, 
He wanted to know how Beth was. He wanted to know this and that. Uh, it wasn't just a notch on the belt for Bill. It was somebody that he cared about. And if you come to the small groups, you're going to, oh, you'll enjoy it because you're going to see a lot of sailboating. <laughs> That's kind of a nice theme. It's real pretty and all that. But you're also going to see how he built a relationship with a really neat guy. And this is a case of a guy who was so good. What does he need God for? I mean, he was just really a good, good guy and um, and took time and Bill shares with that. I'm going to read a couple verses to you from Mark chapter 3. And it's a story about Jesus um, healing a particular person. And I'm going to start at verse 1. It goes this way, Mark 3, 1. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, and that is the Pharisees again, and some of that group. So they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, to the audience, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Now that should have been an obvious answer. And every Sunday school teacher knows that when you ask a question it's kind of obvious, a lot of people don't answer. <laughs> people don't like to answer questions anyhow in discussions. And here they were. And it says that they did not answer. They remained silent. Now I think the reason why they remained silent is because they knew that anything Jesus said or did was going to trap them anyhow. So here they were. They came to look to... to Diffuse Jesus, to discredit Jesus, and here he is turning it all on them. And then it goes on in verse four, uh, in verse five, it says, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Wow. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians on how they might kill Jesus. That's incredible. This text kind of displays the attitude. Uh, there was the attitude of the Pharisees. They, they did not care about this individual. All they, they, this person was somebody that they could use to trip up Jesus, make him look bad, and get what they wanted. What was Jesus' attitude? He cared about the person. He, he went out of his way to minister to this person. Now, you and I aren't going to bring healing physically to people. God can do that, but we don't do that. But the point there is that for Jesus, it illustrated what is always his major number one cause in life, and that is people. What Jesus Christ cares about is people. God is in pursuit of people, just like those guys earlier. I love that. I like the inner city accents and all that stuff. But you know, God is in pursuit of people. And I've found people who God has been pursuing that sometimes they don't understand it. Sometimes they become very bitter. Sometimes you, you almost don't even want to be around them because they're so miserable because the Spirit of God is attacking them so strongly. But be patient and work with them and try to reach them for Jesus Christ. That same radical love that Jesus had and showed in Mark chapter 3 or illustrated in Luke chapter 15 or discussed in, in Psalm 139 is the kind of love you and I need to show to people. It's okay to give books, and Bill did that. He gave a copy of a book. It's okay to give CDs. It's okay to give tapes and sermons. But the greatest resource that you're going to give to somebody is yourself and getting involved in their lives and ministering to them. You don't have to be good at it. All you have to do, you don't have to present the gospel. Bill didn't do that. What impressed Dave? It impressed Dave that he cared, that he was genuine, that what was important to Dave somehow was important to, to Bill. If you come and listen to the, the rest of the story, you'll find out that Bill simply would say to him, I'm going to pray for you this week as you go to work. I'm going to pray for you with, with Beth. I'm going to pray that somehow God reveals himself to you. And that really impacted him. You have a new week that's about to unfold in front of you this week. You can choose to invest it in whatever consumes you, or you can choose to invest it 
and whatever brings glory and satisfaction to God. The challenge for this week is to develop friendships, to discover their stories, um, unearth the process of what's going on in their lives, and then discern what steps to take next. Lean heavily upon the Spirit of God to guide your every action, your every word. He will do that. He will do that. He will give you the words. He will give you the action. But you need to make yourself available to Him. And this week, let's be spiritually alert to the Spirit of God, to His promptings, and let's ask Him to lead us to someone that maybe we might be able to build a bridge for Christ to. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for just Your grace that You've given through Jesus Christ and for the privilege of all of us to be a part of the power of what God is doing, for the privilege that we have of serving You. And Lord, help us to discern and and to see, discover people that are in need of You. And to even be bold enough to, to go a step further and to enter into their lives and to help them come to know Christ. God, we know that it's a process. We know that it doesn't happen overnight. It could be years sometimes. But let us be a part of that. Let us be a part of what you are doing. That's where the joy is. That's where the excitement is. And Lord, we just, um, we're not able. We're not strong. We're not smart. We're not capable of doing it. All we can do is just lean upon you. Give us the privilege of seeing that happen in our own lives so that we can uh, enjoy what great things you are doing. And we want to honor you and praise you with that. In Christ's name, amen.